This video is supported by CuriosityStream. We're living in the age of mega corporations with companies like Google, Apple, and Amazon taking over every facet of our lives. In fact, there's a whole list of words that I can't say right now because if I do, then hundreds of people's computers and devices might just accidentally purchase something. Just a sec. I said this series and I thought it said, hey Siri. As of the beginning of this year, Apple overtook Amazon to become the most valuable company in the world. Now, there's a lot of different ways to measure a company's value, but the market capitalization of Apple at the end of last year anyway was at $1.3 trillion. Now, it's tempting to think this is a modern phenomenon and rail against this hyper accumulation of wealth by certain companies, and there's plenty to talk about in that regard, but if you think Apple is the most valuable company of all time, I got four words for you. The Dutch East India Company. Officially known by this name, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. The Dutch East India Company was created in 1602 to try to challenge the Portuguese dominance of trade in Asia, and they went on to create a trade monopoly that basically ran the world for like 200 years. They were the first multinational corporation, and they controlled the flow of goods like silk, spices, tea, and silver through the use of thousands of merchant ships, forts, and dozens of port cities around the world, and at their height, they had a standing army of 260,000. Yes, this company had a standing army of 260,000 people. They were worth more and controlled more than any other country or kingdom that was around in their day. Adjusted for inflation, their worth today would be like $7.8 trillion. And there's a lot that could be said about the way the Dutch East India Company ran their business and the effect that they had on the world. But the fact of the matter is they completely transformed the way businesses work, the way corporations work, financial institutions that we still feel to this day. It's hard to imagine a company having more wealth than the Dutch East India Company. But there are some people who believe that there's an opportunity right around the corner that's going to create companies that would make them look like a lemonade stand. And that's asteroid mining. How do we define what's valuable? What makes one stone a precious gem and another stone just gravel? What makes one autograph worth thousands of dollars and another one completely worthless? Generally, the value of something goes up the more rare it is. So diamonds, which you can't just pick up laying around on the ground, are worth a lot more than gravel, which totally does. In fact, one of the things that made the Dutch East India Company so rich was the spices they moved around the world. Because at the time, you could only find these spices in certain places in the world, and those places generally were on the other side of the world. And because there wasn't really much of an infrastructure at the time to move those things around, they became really valuable. How valuable? The Dutch actually traded the island of Manhattan for nutmeg. Yeah, you know how old New York was once New Amsterdam? Well, that's because the Dutch settled there first and then the English came in later and kind of took control and it became contested area for a while. But eventually the Dutch gave it up in exchange for access to some British islands that grew nutmeg there. And to them at that time, nutmeg was more valuable than the island of Manhattan. Today, nutmeg is just one of a pile of spices that I have in my cupboard that just fall onto the floor whenever I open the doors to it. That's because we now plant these all over the world with advanced agricultural practices and a vast infrastructure to move it around cheaply. Of course, then there's the other side of that equation, which is demand. Not only was spice hard to get your hands on, but a lot of people wanted it. Today, a lot of people want phones and computers and devices to stay relevant, keep in touch with friends and family, and sometimes just show off. And all these devices require metals and minerals like aluminum, zinc, iron, nickel, copper, and about 17 other rare earth metals. And all of these have a finite supply. You know, there's only so much of it here on earth, and on earth there's only so much of it that we have access to. So once again, high demand, limited supply. But imagine what we could do with an almost unlimited source of dirt cheap minerals. Because we basically have that in our cosmic backyard. You know the asteroid belt, you remember that from school, the area between Mars and Jupiter that has up to 1.9 million asteroids in it. What you may not know is that some of those asteroids have minerals that make them worth not billions, not trillions, quadrillions of dollars. Quadrillions. Because those asteroids formed the same way the Earth did 4.6 billion years ago at the start of our solar system. They weren't created in some separate process, so they contain all the same minerals that we have here on Earth with one little difference. When the Earth formed, gravity caused the heavier metals to sink toward the center, which is why we have a solid iron core at the center of the Earth. This makes the minerals difficult to get to because they want to sink down closer to the center. But asteroids are way smaller and have tiny amounts of gravity, which means that all those minerals are just kind of sitting there on the surface. 
In fact, most of the elements that we find near the surface are thought to have actually been put there by ancient asteroid impacts. Of course, some of the asteroids have more of the good stuff than others. Uh, there's a lot of different types of asteroids, but they generally fall into three main categories. C-type asteroids, or chondrite asteroids, are the most common. They mostly consist of clay and silicate rocks, and they're dark in appearance. The S-types, or stony asteroids, are made up of silicate materials and nickel iron. And the M-types are metallic, usually made of nickel, iron, and platinum. Now, all of those asteroids can be found in the asteroid belt, but that's not the only place you can find asteroids in the solar system. Jupiter has a couple of groups of what they call Trojan asteroids that follow and lead the planet in its orbit around the sun. These are also known as Lagrangian trapped asteroids because they're trapped at Jupiter's Lagrange points. These are areas around every planet where the planet's gravity and the sun's gravity counterbalance each other. Mars and Neptune both have Trojans. Even Earth has a Trojan asteroid that they found in 2011. But Jupiter, always the show off, has far more Trojans than everybody else. In fact, it's thought that there might be as many Trojans trailing Jupiter as there are in the asteroid belt itself. So clearly there's just money just floating around in space. So, so why don't we go get it? Well, it's possibly because it's, you know, 330 million miles away. So there's that. And Jupiter's another 50 million miles away at its closest point. But have no fear, aspiring quadrillionaires, because there's also NEAs, or near-Earth asteroids, that pass really close to Earth and could possibly hit us, so maybe have some fear. Actually, most NEAs are not on a collision course with Earth so much as just pass within our orbit, but either way, they're, they're much closer to us than the asteroid belt, and there's about 15,000 of them out there. Of course, you don't need to mine 15,000 asteroids. All you need to do is find one with a lot of good stuff in it and just go to town. Luckily, there's a lot of good ones out there. Let's start with a few standouts like 511 Davida, 344 Chicago, and 702 Alada. These and many more asteroids are all valued over $100 trillion each. The problem is they're very big and very far away. Some closer to home options include Anteros, which is about 1.43 AUs away. It's a Type C asteroid with an estimated profit of $1.25 trillion. Then there's Ryugu, which is about 1.19 AU away. It's another Type C asteroid valued at around $82 billion. We've actually already visited Ryugu with JAXA's Hayabusa 2 mission. It actually collected some samples and is on its way back to Earth right now. But the mother of all asteroid adventures would be a trip to 16 Psyche. 16 Psyche is out there in the asteroid belt. It's a little potato shaped at 173 miles at its widest, and it's made up of mostly iron, nickel, and gold, with a little platinum thrown in for good measure. It's basically made out of little John's teeth. Its total value has been estimated at around 700 quintillion dollars. Quintillion, that is a seven with 20 zeros behind it. Of course, that's at gold's current prices. If you were to just introduce all that to the world, it would completely crater the market. So if anybody were to mine 16 Psyche, they would have to introduce that gold just a little bit at a time. And NASA actually has plans to visit 16 Psyche in 2022 with a mission appropriately named Psyche. They actually just announced on February 28th that it will go up on a Falcon Heavy in June 2022, make a flyby of Mars in 2023, and enter orbit around the asteroid in 2024. But no plans to bring anything back. And that's because NASA's not interested in minerals. It wants to study 16 Psyche because it might be the leftover core of a protoplanet. Remember how I said that most of the heavy metals on Earth like sank down closer to the core because of gravity? Well, it's thought that 16 Psyche it has so much metal in it because it's the leftover core of a small planet that got smashed up in the early solar system. And this is thought to be true of many of the metallic asteroids that are out there, which is why there's so few of them. So a trip to 16 Psyche would not only verify that it is the core of a protoplanet, but it would also give us a good look at the core of a planet for the first time. I mean, yeah, we think we know a lot about the Earth's core, but we've never been anywhere near it. You know, there's still a lot of mysteries surrounding it that some of them might be answered by a trip to 16 Psyche. And really, who can put a price on knowledge? 700 quintillion. Of course, there is a commodity you can find on asteroids that may be worth even more than gold, water. Water in the form of ice is thought to be all over the solar system, locked away in asteroids, dwarf planets, and moons. Most notably Ceres, which is thought to be made up of 30% to 50% water underneath its surface. Water, of course, is necessary for humans to survive, but you can also make all kinds of other things with it as well. You can make oxygen and hydrogen for fuel, oxygen for breathing, obviously. You can combine hydrogen with carbon to make hydrocarbon propellants like methane. So a mining station on Ceres would not only give you resources to travel throughout the rest of the solar system, but it could also power other mining operations in the asteroid belt. If only somebody would put that into a book or a TV show. Now, NASA's starting work on this kinds of technology uh, much closer to home. This is actually part of the Artemis program. They're planning on making a, a moon base near the South Pole to take advantage of water ice that can be found in the permanently shadowed, you know, craters down there. 
Ultimately, the vision is to create a way station at the moon where deep space missions can refuel and then start off on their journey from a much smaller gravity well. Of course, you may be asking, how exactly is this going to work? How are we going to mine these big old rock potatoes in the sky? Now, the first option is just surface mining, just scraping up regolith and debris from the surface of the asteroids because these are basically just a bunch of rocks that are held together very lightly by gravity. Then there's shaft mining, where they actually drill down into the rock and pull the ore up from inside the asteroid to the surface where they can be processed and used in that way. Now again, because even the biggest asteroids are just tiny compared to Earth, the gravity is going to work totally different there, so any kind of drilling mechanism would have to actually be able to latch on to the rock to give it leverage. Now another idea is called magnetic raking, which is kind of similar to the surface mining I was just talking about, but they basically use a giant magnet to just go over the surface so that all the ferrous metals would just come up and attract to it. Then there's just heating. Basically, if you heat up the rock, then all the water that's trapped in ice would come off as water vapor, and then you could just collect it and use it that way. Honeybee is a robotics company that's working on something like this. They actually created the drill on the Curiosity rover. They basically want to put a bag, a giant bag around the asteroid, and then heat it up, and then just collect all the water vapor that comes off of it like that. Pretty smart. And last but not least is something called the MOND process, which basically involves putting the asteroid in an enclosure and then heating it up with carbon monoxide to 60 degrees Celsius. And this is pretty cool. This is actually a way to collect the nickel and the iron because what happens is that that carbon monoxide bonds with the nickel to create nickel tetracarbonyl and it bonds with the iron to make iron petrocarbonyl. These are liquids that can then be collected, taken somewhere else, and then chemically processed back into their original form. So through all these methods, we can collect water and use that for drinking and for fuel. We can collect precious metals for electronics components. We can collect more common metals for building and infrastructure projects. Now, there's some people that think that this is just way too much work. So they advocate just finding an asteroid and then, you know, just smashing it into Earth. You know, why send legions of probes and robots when you can just direct an asteroid toward a relatively uninhabited area, smash it into the ground, and then just pick it up off the ground? I mean, what could go wrong? Of course, this would only be for the sole purpose of getting rich. This wouldn't, you know, expand our you know, civilization out into the solar system or anything. Of course, if all you're interested in is getting rich, then why bother collecting all the, the minerals off the ground? Just threaten to point the asteroid towards a major city unless the world pays a hefty ransom. Just go full James Bond villain and get it over with. I'm looking at you, Jeff Bezos. You already got the look down. But here's a good question. Is it even legal to take minerals from outer space? Like, who owns them? Well, according to the 1967 Space Treaty, there are no territorial lines in space. Space belongs to everyone. <laughs> Which is why when we landed on the moon, we put a, a United States flag up. Like, first thing. That treaty, however, only applies to countries. Could a private citizen with enough money go up there and take whatever they want? Actually, yes. According to the Space Act of 2015, it establishes a framework where private companies and citizens could collect whatever they want up there. It's basically finders keepers. And this is the act that opened the door to the cosmic gold rush. But how close are we to this actually happening? Well, it depends on what you actually consider mining. As I mentioned before, the Hayabusa 2 mission to Ryugu is already bringing some samples back to, to Earth. Some of the samples were from the surface, and some were subsurface samples that were collected by firing a bullet at the asteroid and creating a spray. Japan beat the U.S. to shooting an asteroid. It's embarrassing. This sample is expected to return to Earth later this year, but its predecessor, Hayabusa 1, already returned a very small sample, just a few grains from the asteroid Itakawa in 2010. It was only some grains of dust, but it did show that the asteroid has plentiful ice water on its surface. So if you consider a few grains of dust to be mining, then we've already started. Hayabusa 2 will have a much more significant payload, but we don't really know exactly how much just yet. Then there's the OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu. OSIRIS has actually been orbiting around Bennu for a couple of years now, and later this year it's going to collect some samples from it. In December, they picked the site they want to investigate, a crater they named Nightingale, which is apparently positioned in a way that avoids the worst of the temperature swings that the asteroid experiences, thinking that, you know, it would preserve any organic molecules that might be down there. It's expected to bring home between 60 grams and 2 kilograms of material, which sounds like a vast range to me, but I guess we'll see. Another couple of missions worth mentioning are the Phobos Grunt 2 mission from Roscosmos, which is expected to launch in 2024, and it's going to do a sample return mission from Phobos, one of the moons around Mars, which is basically a captured asteroid. 
And the Viper rover, which is part of the Artemis program, its job is to find water resources near the lunar south pole. It was expected to launch in 2022. It's now been pushed back to 2023, which is only one year before humans are supposed to land there in 2024. So, yeah. Now all this sounds really promising and it all sounds really exciting. So let's throw some cold water on that, shall we? Asteroid mining's already hit a bit of a bubble with a couple of companies that got out of the gate really early on. They generated a lot of money, got a lot of interest in it, and then found out this is actually pretty hard. The most famous of these companies is Planetary Resources, which was founded in 2012 by Peter Diamandis and Chris Lewicki. They raised like $50 million right off the bat from people like James Cameron and the founder of Google, Eric Schmidt. Another company was called Deep Space Industries, or DSI. They raised a lot less money, but they still got a lot of attention. Today, both of these companies have folded. Planetary Resources was recently bought out by a blockchain company called Cosensus for reasons that nobody seems to understand. And DSI was bought out by a company called Bradford Space. They actually create uh, attitude and propulsion systems for satellites. Now, it should be said that while both of these ventures failed, they did manage to lobby enough to get the Space Act of 2015 passed, which kind of lays the legal framework for asteroid mining in the future. So for better or for worse, they did get that done. The problem seems to be that investors actually want to make money back on their investments, which I know sounds insane. But asteroid mining is one of those ventures that's going to take decades, maybe even generations to become profitable. Now granted, those profits are astronomical, but still it's a long time for... <laughs> I just said astronomical, didn't I? I'm so clever. But seriously, we keep hearing all the time and especially on this channel that we're in this whole new space race where private companies for the first time were able to get up into space for cheaper and cheaper than ever before. I mean, this plus the fact that we're exploring asteroids like never before with, you know, Hayabusa and Osiris Rex, with all that, you know, riches out there just waiting to be plundered. How is it that asteroid mining has taken such a tumble lately? It seems like it should be hotter than ever, right? So paradoxically, it's this new space race that might actually kind of be the holdup. Like, let's say you're an investor with disgusting amounts of money burning a hole in your pocket and you want to profit from this new space race. Are you going to invest in a small sat company that could be doing communications and gathering data that you can sell in a matter of a year or two? Or are you going to invest in asteroid mining, which might become profitable by the time your grandkids enter college? Not that long ago, that first option didn't exist. So yeah, asteroid mining was kind of cool. But now... <laughs> gotta make that cash, son! The fact of the matter is, the infrastructure necessary to make asteroid mining profitable just doesn't exist yet. Like for example, take OSIRIS-REx we were just talking about. It's bringing two kilograms of regolith back from Bennu. Now obviously this regolith isn't being brought back in the effort to make money, it's going to be studied, but let's just say it was. What if it was bringing back two kilograms of pure gold? Right now the price of gold is give or take around $50,000 per kilogram, so about $100,000 is what you could make from doing that. The cost of OSIRIS-REx is $183.5 million. You would be making back 0.05% of what you put into it. That would be like giving somebody $100 and getting back a nickel. It's not a good investment. Now I know a lot of you are bludgeoning your fingers against the keyboard saying that OSIRIS-REx was not a mining mission, that it was a science mission, it was going to cost more money because of the science equipment, that it wasn't designed to create, you know, value, and oh yeah, yeah, I get it, you're right about all that, I know, I get it, you're right, you can stop. But it does illustrate just what a gap there is between the profits and the costs of asteroid mining. This is the problem that Planetary Resources and DSI ran into and couldn't ever quite overcome. Not without some kind of infrastructure in place. So it's kind of a chicken and egg situation right now. You know, will asteroid mining spur the creation of a space infrastructure that would make that possible? Or is it the building of the space infrastructure that will make asteroid mining possible? Now, if you use the American gold rush of the 1800s as a blueprint, it's a little bit of both. You know, once somebody became profitable finding that gold, then suddenly there were railroads, small towns, general stores, tools, equipment, clothing, all of that came up afterwards. A lot more money was made on the rush than was made on the gold. This is why I honestly think that asteroid mining is going to be a lot less about, you know, finding precious metals and bringing them back to Earth, and a lot more about that in situ resource utilization that's going to open up pathways to the rest of the solar system. And while NASA is focused on perfecting ISRU on the moon, and SpaceX is all in on Mars, and Blue Origin wants to build giant construction projects in space, somewhere in there is the opportunity for some enterprising company to become the Dutch East India Company of the solar system. But what do you think? Do you think there's some clever ways to get that sweet asteroid resources that I'm not talking about here? Are there some cool companies that are working on some cool stuff that are worth talking about? 
discuss down in the comments. Now asteroids are, of course, just part of this crazy solar system that we live in, and there have been dozens of missions and probes that have gone out to asteroids and moons and planets that have expanded our knowledge of the solar system. If you're interested in that, which I think you are if you watch this video, then you might want to check out Secrets of the Solar System on CuriosityStream. This series is far more than just a documentary about the planets and stuff. It's also about the human journey we've taken over the last hundred years to explore the solar system, featuring interviews with people who worked on these journeys. It's an incredible and heartfelt look, not just at the solar system, but the human need for exploration that drives our species. Seriously, I'm super late getting this video recorded because I couldn't stop watching this series. It's, of course, just one of thousands of documentary titles that you can find on CuriosityStream from world-class filmmakers on everything from space, history, prehistory, physics, biographies, you name it. It's the streaming service for curious minds by the people who started the Discovery Channel, and it's seriously one of my favorite things on the internet. Also, when you sign up for CuriosityStream, you get free access to Nebula, a streaming service that I'm a part of, as well as some of the most popular science communicators on the internet, like Kurzgesagt, uh, CGP Grey, Isaac Arthur, Minute Physics, Real Engineering, the list goes on and on. Nebula not only gives you all of our YouTube videos ad-free, but it also gives you access to Nebula Originals that you can't find anywhere else. It's a place where we can create the kind of content we want to create without being beholden to the YouTube algorithm, or any algorithm for that matter. CuriosityStream has a special offer for viewers of this channel. If you sign up at curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, you'll get the first 31 days free. That's a month. You can watch anything you want. And after that, it's only $2.99 a month, which is just ridiculously crazy. So before they change their mind on this, uh, definitely go check it out. curiositystream.com slash Joe Scott, and you'll get Nebula for free as well. So do it. Big thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are supporting this whole channel, helping me to grow a team, forming an awesome community. I love these guys. There's some new people who have just joined. Let me murder their names real quick. We got John Klein, Kevin F., Valerie Blassi, uh, Balas Suhada, I think, uh, Brandon, Juliana Davis, Andrea Nia, Bobby Schneider, Neil Hoover, Karina Nazario, Ryan Anderson, Sandra Robinson, Charles F. Scott, and David Beal. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get early access to videos, and just join an awesome group of people, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. We're talking about exploring space. T-shirts like this about exploring space are available on the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Uh, there's all kinds of cool designs. There's hoodies, mugs, posters, all this cool stuff. Go check it out. It supports the channel, and it gives you something cool. So answerswithjoe.com slash store. Please like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like this video, and Google never is wrong at anything. Uh, and if uh, you like this video, if you say some others and you like them, and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And with that, I bid you adieu. You guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.